Greetings, Tony Mobley here, and I'm back. A new episode of Conversation with Tony Mobley. And tonight, I have a good friend, a new friend that I met through COVID, who is a audio genius. And so, he might mind me saying that, but it's the truth. Uh, and so, my good friend, Jeff Francis, is going to be with us tonight on our conversation. I'm excited to have him on, and I just want to let the audience know that what you're looking at on YouTube is a new, brand new production that was started on last week, and so this, what you're seeing tonight is a great new production that the Office Hours members have decided 
to upgrade conversations with Tony Mobley. And so we're very excited about it. And so if you want to know more about it, we want you to tune in to Office Hours on Friday, Friday morning at the normal Office Hours time of 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm sorry, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. A.M. And we will have a great conversation about how all of this is done on and also you have some insights to the back channel and all of the things that are working so tonight my my special guest is mr jeff francis of the university of south carolina and he is um he coordinates the audio production of audio production and live streaming so we hope to have a very informative conversation about audio, but also we hope to have a great conversation with Jeff about his life and the things that brought him to being where he is and being able to share in the height of COVID how he was able to work through some processes. And so we're going to get started in just a few seconds. And so you might have a question of why are we here? Why does Conversation with Tony Mobley exist? The reason why it exists is because I am a product of office hours. And because of the challenges that I've had in my life personally, I have made the decision that I wanted to share some of the great things that are happening in office hours with the community at large, but also we want to have authentic conversations with people wherever they are. And so without further ado, my friend, Jeff Francis. Thank you, Jeff, for being here. Thank you so much, Tony. It's great to be here. And uh, like you, I've found all new friends uh, during COVID through the connection we made uh, on office hours. And I still have in my mind that uh, world trip that I'm gonna take, where I'm gonna go around and I'm gonna visit everyone, um, stop in. And, and I've promised, uh, you know, Hasmuk, I've promised that I'm gonna stop in. It's, you know, Noonan, Georgia is gonna be on my way and I'll go through South Dakota and go see Chris down in Texas and I'll make my way up to see Greg up in Norway and out to see Mickey and we'll just make my way around the globe. So uh, as soon as we can get that international travel working and uh, you know, I can get a big grant to do that, we'll, uh, we'll head on the way. So um, Fantastic. yeah, I'm looking forward to the, uh, to the office hours uh, breakdown because um, I want to see what's going on behind the scenes because I I don't know I'm just I'm just on here as a panelist and I'm, I'm letting all the people back there uh, do their magic so I am, I'm excited to see what the YouTube looks like and uh, I'm looking forward to that breakdown um, Friday morning which um, so it'll be I guess that's the second hour Friday morning so that'll be yes uh, what is that 8 a.m. Pacific is that correct I think in Eastern yep. time so. 8 a.m. Pacific mm -hmm. will be that breakdown. That'll be awesome. So tell me how you want to proceed. So we, we can start with your lab. Okay. So, so this is a fun one. Um, this is a, a little bit of a goofy one, but I've done this for, I've done this for a fourth grade science class. I do this for undergraduates. I've done this for adults, uh, undergraduates are supposed to be adults, but let's face it, they're not yet. Um, <laughs> and everyone loves it. So what we're going to do, uh, this is what I call the, the world's simplest or the world's cheapest record player. So if you want to play along at home, I'm going to tell you the very few things you need. So you can do that. Um, you're going to need a record, an LP, a phonograph, um, preferably one you don't mind scratching up because this is not the world's best record player. It's the world's cheapest and simplest. Uh, you'll need a standard wooden pencil. What's that for? Pencil goes in the hole. We'll get back to that later. Now you need things, a sheet of paper, some tape, and a plain sewing needle or pin. 
So hopefully, let's see. Y'all see it over here? And can you still hear me as I'm yelling out here? Okay, so yes, I'm sir, take we this can piece hear you. Paper, and I'm just going to roll this into a cone. Think your favorite waffle cone, ice cream cone. Little piece of tape, hold that together. All the audio people know what I'm doing here. Um, we just made a cone that's going to be. What this is going to do is it's going to connect the impedance of the record to the impedance of the air. So it's going to make the vibrations of the record come through to the air. Now, the way a record works, and this is great because this is a great explanation of analog audio. What's if you looked at this under a microscope, you would see hills and valleys of the groove going up and down. And those are literally an analogy of the audio waveform, the sound waveform, the same pressure waves that are in the air. So our sewing needle, take our sewing needle, and we put that on the end of our cone. You don't have to be precise with this. And now the grooves are going to vibrate the needle, which is going to vibrate the cone, which should make sound. And that's Very how cool. simple a record player is. Wow. So I know that Fantastic. that's a quick lab, but, but it kind of gives you a way to touch and build and play with something that we can't really touch than that sound. Can, Can you talk? I'm sorry, go ahead. All right. Can I just jump in uh, to tell uh, the attendees? to please vote on the questions that, that are there and to add your own questions. I know that that awesome lab has brought some questions up for you. Fantastic. So, so where did you get that idea from? I can't remember. <laughs> I've been doing it for so long. Um, I have a Victrola. It would belong to my, my wife's family. So we have a, uh, I think it's a 1919 Victrola record player. So it works on that same principle. It still works. It's got a hand crank. So you crank up a spring so you don't have to worry about me trying to spin at exactly 33 and a third RPM. Um, the Victrola, of course, runs 78s, but it's literally a needle. And the Victrola needles are even uh, thicker than a sewing needle. Modern day record players have very tiny uh, styli, but on the Victrola, it's, it's a very coarse needle and it goes to a little tiny diaphragm that's like a, a miniature drum head. It's connected to that. And then from there, it's an expanding cone. And that expanding cone is the same thing we use in, uh, modern speakers because they're, it creates efficiency. Um, the record and the needle moving by itself is not going to move a lot of air. So by moving the cone, it makes it easier to move the air, and that's that impedance connection. Just a quick question, Jeff. I, I thought through the whole thing, I thought, well, we can hardly hear him when he goes over to where he's working on the record. Will we be able to hear a lot of sound out of the record? And then it was loud. So my question is, how did you make that happen? Um, it's fairly loud. I mean, I usually do this demonstration just in a room and everybody in the room can hear it. Um, but I did put a second mic up there by the cone just to make sure everybody could hear that. Um, so that was 
you know, there's a mic at the end of the cone where I just held that up. So kind of, uh, so right there is my secret record player microphone. And, and like cool. every good audio engineer and tech person, it's literally just gaff taped to the, to the light that I put here because I only need it for today. It's good, use, it's good to use gaff tape instead of duct tape. I'm sorry. I did use gaff tape. I said yeah. duct tape by accident. No, we I had this said, discussion. I think you said gaff tape. No, I think you said Okay. <laughs> no, I said duct tape earlier when I was telling this, when I was set the mic up. Yeah, Mickey. Yes, Mickey. Uh, Jeff, have you done any uh, comparisons between uh, between different uh, thicknesses of paper and the uh, qu the quality and uh, amplitude of the reproduction? I have not tried cardstock um, or, or or a heavier weight paper. Um, it would probably take a little bit more to wrap it into that cone. The biggest problem I have is is maintaining um, the spin. So oftentimes in class, I'll get someone else to hold the, the record and I'll try to maintain a, a steady spin and also keeping it, keeping it level because it does, you know, it does go up and down. So it's hard to keep the needle in the groove, but it's a fun, it's a fun parlor trick, you know, take that one with you, impress your friends. Uh, like I said, fourth graders blown away, you know? Undergraduates, they're blown away too. It's and it's it's got the you know the vintage vibe to it. Everybody loves, um, and there's a very good reason we love LPs. And uh, you know, people will fight with me, but I'm not a big fan of the sound. Um, but I just love having something in my hands. I love being uh, putting it on and and listening for a long period of time because uh, you know if it's on my phone, I'm I'm too apt to shuffle and skip. But putting on an LP, and I'm, I'm going to listen through a long chunk of material that uh, that the artist designed, and just to have artwork and something, you know, I think people in this age are yearning for something to hold, and I think that's part of why a lot of the the vintage LP and other thing resurgence is where we want physical things, we want something tangible because such of our world is just intangible digital. And I'm I'm going to I'm going to do something that I normally don't do, and I want to just take a quick break right here, uh, Jeff, because of the magnitude of the guests that we have with you, the other panelists, and the fact that they are in various parts of the world. I just want to take a few minutes for them to introduce themselves and share with those who are watching and listening where they're coming from. So we're gonna start with Mickey. Hey, I'm uh, Mickey, I'm based in the Philippines. Uh, I do location sound and uh, post-production sound for, uh, for TV shows, films, uh, advertising and the like. And uh, well, my, my uh, mentor for life is Greg Curta, who's also on this panel. And so, Greg. Uh, okay, uh, I'm Greg Kurta, and I'm in um, Steinger, Norway, teaching at Nord University here in the film and TV and the, the games program. And um, uh, now a student of Mickey's. So uh, I think I think that's uh, I think this is wonderful how how everything comes full circle. And uh, and also in the uh, in the Jeff Francis for Saint Sainthood, um, it's a gathering movement. Um, you know, we're, we tend to be apolitical, but uh, but you know, concentrated on one one thing: the continuing uh, effort for Jeff Francis. But so that's my, that's my story, and I'm sticking to Greg, it. Greg, Greg also. Tell us what time it is for you right now. Uh, it is now 2.16, 57 seconds. AM. AM. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. Carl? 
So my name is Carl. I'm based in Adelaide, Australia. Uh, my day job is that I'm an event photographer. Um, and since COVID started, um, I've been adding in uh, audio recording for community and charity groups. So mainly orchestras and string ensembles for people who don't really get recorded very often. Um, they will hire me as a photographer and I'll kind of add in the audio stuff on top for them. Okay. And Carl, what time is it for you as well? So for me, it's at 9.46 in the morning. Tomorrow morning for you guys in the future. Okay. Andy? Oh, Andy Lipnick, San Francisco, where it is a civilized 517 in the afternoon. <laughs> um, I'm an audio engineer. I specialize in live events with audiences uh, doing mostly corporate events, but I have a background in music and theater as well. Um, and um, when Jeff was talking about holding the piece of media, um, I came up through cutting tape and holding a piece of tape. That was the sound. And I'm really glad that I had a chance to do that for a few years before I got into digital workstations. It really gave me a, uh, I feel like it gave me a deep understanding of like, this piece of tape is now this section of sound or waveform on the screen. So that was, that was useful. And Jeff, when you were demonstrating the, uh, just doing your, your demo, I reached around me. I have a Edison cylinder here. <laughs> and um, this, you can answer this now or later, but uh, one of my questions is how did we get from this to vinyl to where we are now? And it's a huge question, I know, but I thought I'd ask it at some point. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And so my good friend, Talak uh, Lopez Waterman is here and he is going to be doing our questions tonight. And so if he wanted to share some information with, with the panel and with those of you who are watching, I want him to uh, share that at this time. So I would absolutely urge everyone to please go and ask questions in the Q&A section of uh, either the Q&A section of uh, the webinar, or if you're watching on YouTube, you can ask the questions in the live chat on, on YouTube and we will get uh, those put into our webinar so that we can get uh, voted on, get those questions voted on, and then we can ask them. And um, uh, we want we want to hear your questions, and we want you to you to tell us how this show will continue forward. Um, and so we already have we have a few questions uh, uh, ready to go. If if you're interested inter interested in us uh, moving along here, Tony. Jeff, are you ready? Yes. Before you start, I do want to ask Andy. Um, by the way, Andy, I have a cylinder just just to the left of that uh, base back there. There's a cylinder sitting. But I actually want to ask. Uh, I also cut my teeth cutting tape, and it was a great experience. But I would want to ask a question: Aren't you really glad you never need to touch analog tape and slice it with a razor blade ever again? <laughs> uh, I have mixed feelings, only because I liked doing it it was because it, it's so tactile um but but just the fact that you know i'm on a show site and someone says hey we need the first few seconds of this cut off you know it's i can do it in seconds versus you know rocking reels finding the plug taking out your wax your wax pencil and marking up the tape and all that so the answer is yes and no Mostly, no, I don't miss it. <laughs> Just the other day, I was editing with uh, one of our pianists via Zoom, um, and we cut in one bar of a piece that they, and unfortunately, it was the only time they played it right, and they played it at a slightly different tempo. So we ended up putting, uh, I think, eight edits in that one bar to stretch things out to match the time. And boy, I'm glad I wasn't using a razor blade for that. And on that, uh, Tlaloc. Hopefully I got that right. I practiced from the lab last week. Um, <laughs> very, very good. Thank you so much. Ready for questions. All right. All right. Our first question is, how did COVID-19 affect your workflow life on campus? Um, I was busier than ever. So uh, we came back from spring break and 2020 and were shut down and had to move classes online. Um, 
I felt somewhat well prepared for that. Um, several years ago, I did get my master's in educational technology, which is all fo focused on that. And I had made my classes sort of hybrid where a lot of the material was delivered in video lectures beforehand and students would come in and we get hands on with things. So it wasn't that difficult. Um, what became really difficult was planning for how we're going to deal with this, this past year. Um, because up to that point we were, you know, we were recording events. We had a, a static camera that would capture video. We were doing no streaming whatsoever and come fall 2020, we wanted to have multi-camera streaming in three venues. And so, uh, I credit a lot to office hours cause boy, I got on there and when I discovered that and asked, asked many questions and that helped me, uh, spend the university's limited funds as a good steward, um, because I could make the right decisions and purchase the right equipment the first time after, uh, doing a lot of research, asking a lot of questions, um, getting a lot of opinions. Um, I actually dove straight into streaming, um, that Friday, uh, I was actually on vacation. We came back, the world shut down sort of, I, I put it as March 11th, um, was, was the day that, that kind of like registered here that, that the world shut down and March 14th was, uh, a concert with our, uh, South Carolina Philharmonic and they decided, um, we can't have an audience. So I normally record them and they emailed me and were like, is there any way you can stream? And I said, yes, figuring, yeah, I'll figure it out over the next day or so. Um, which is, is kind of, if, if I say yes to you, usually it means either I've done it a million times or I've never done it. And boy, I'm going to figure it out by the time we actually get there. Um, and so came into rehearsal Friday, got a camera set up one black magic interface, which we'd done once or twice before with some things. And then I was like, you know, I have this old ATEM television studio, the original ATEM television studio sitting around. I was like, I could dig that thing out and find another couple of cameras and maybe some kind of ethernet HDMI transmitter and to put a camera over here. And so we ended up having three cameras and, uh, streaming that out. Um, and so I already had the sound side of things figured out, which is always a problem. And so we streamed that orchestra, um, that three days later, um, which was a, a huge, a huge success and also a huge kind of just win for everybody emotionally at that point. Um, and it was, uh, it was many, 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 many months before any of those musicians, the city musicians are, uh, campus musicians, the students before any of them, like were able to actually perform with other people again. And so it was, it was a big win there. Um, then when we came back, there was a lot of, how are we going to do classes? How are we going to, how are people going to perform together? So one of the things we did, um, we were very worried less so now, cause I think the, the research has gotten better, but we were very worried about aerosol transmission. So uh, vocalists, brass, woodwinds, all the wind producing instruments can't wear a mask while they're performing. So you have a singer that normally stands a few feet from a pianist and how do they perform for an hour? Well, first of all, we said, okay, if it's aerosol, 30 minutes is it, which if you're doing 30 minutes and then taking a 30 minute break to clear the room, it's really hard to do rehearsals. So we set up Actually, we have uh, a disc clavier, which is a digital piano. Um, and we had that in one room and across the hall from our concert hall. And so we set up that a singer could stand or any performer could stand on stage and they could perform or rehearse with the pianist who was in the room across the hall. And we could do this with a regular piano, of course, just by miking it. But the fact that the disc clavier had an audio output allowed us that we didn't need to have live microphones in this terrible sounding classroom and nobody needed to wear headphones. So it was a very natural thing for performers who are classical musicians and maybe not technical that they could walk into the room. If you're standing on the stage, you can hear the piano. 
The piano also projects out into the hall like it normally would. And the pianist can hear you performing in the hall and play along with you very naturally. And then, of course, we also set up cameras so that each could see the other. Used analog cameras, analog old school tube TV, so there was no delay through the uh, system there. So we had, uh, that was a great, great thing for performers that they could actually rehearse and they could perform. We had a couple other rooms that were set up similarly between practice rooms where people could practice and not be in the same room together. So that's a lot of what uh, building the live streaming was a big part of it. And then all these sort of class related things and rehearsal related things. Wow. That, that, that is a, that is a serious change, Jeff. And kudos to you for being able to, to, to figure all of that out. That's, that's amazing. Um, and, and unfortunately there are probably another, um, a lot of universities that didn't have the advantage of having you uh, figure it out. So um, hopefully if, if things begin to go in that direction again, maybe some of them will be able to glean from, from what you've just sharing with us tonight. We're going to go to the yeah, next there were, question. There were several of us on office hours and in the Discord and everything sharing these ideas back and forth. I just ask that's, a, that's quick, a quick follow up to, to what Jeff was just, uh, just a quick follow up question. Go ahead. Um, it occurs, I, I worked at Boston University for a time and it occurs to me that a university might be one of the few places where you can get analog cameras out of storage because that was my experience at Boston University. So that's my question to you and also to Greg, Greg, because I know you both work at universities. Is, is, that, is that how you, you, were, you were able to get access to that equipment or you just had it there anyway? We have it for, uh, we use analog cameras for conductor cams for opera. So if there are uh, offstage, uh, anytime we do offstage musicians, off, you know, they, they might put a, an ensemble backstage uh, singing and they need to be able to see the conductor and they can't because of the set is in the way. So we have um, analog cameras you know, basic CCTV, you know, security cameras with infrared and lots of, we, we don't throw away tube televisions. When, when I pulled one out of my father-in-law's house, it went to the university and went into storage there because when they die, we're not fixing them. So we hang on to them. And, and you haven't found a, like a digital solution that doesn't impose some little delay? Uh, the one we did between the practice rooms was about the smallest we could find. Um, and it would, was a, there's still a little bit of a delay, but we felt it was fine for practice. Um, okay. but no, pretty much just easier to go with the analog. Go ahead, Mickey. Uh, what has been your experience with remote music collaboration? I know it's an, it's been evolving, uh, uh, for the past year and a half, two years. Um, oh, where are we now? Oh, where, where did you start and where are we now with that? Well, Andy, and that's when I met Andy, is we started cutting our teeth on, uh, what was it, Jamulus? I think that was one uh, of the first ones we tried, yeah. One of the ones we tried, Jamulus and a few others, um, and never found it uh, satisfying as a musician. Um, I'm interested, uh, you know, we, Alex had the Elk, the Aloha by Elk audio people on a few weeks ago, and uh, I signed up, tried to get in their, in their beta test thing, but uh, I'm interested to see how that plays out. Um, it is a little bit limiting as far as interface because you have to use their interface, which is, I think, how they're trying to get down the latency. And it's, um, you know, we used for audio on the campus, Dante, and, and that was great but trying to do that over longer distances. I know they're doing some experiments with that in, in England with some, uh, they basically have an education uh, network, you know, what I think of as, as internet two here in the States, but um, I don't know where we're gonna, if we'll ever get to where remote collaboration is actually possible. I mean, I, I my rule of thumb 
you know, sound is 1130 feet per second. Um, but that's close enough to be about a foot a millisecond. So, you know, I talked to my students, I'm like, sound goes about that far in a millisecond. So musicians standing, you know, 20 feet apart, you've got 20 milliseconds of delay. And that's where it starts to get problematic to play intricate, complicated lines together. Um, I know working with classical musicians, I have to be really careful in recording sessions. If I want to ask them to move apart for separation or something about sound, I have to be really careful about that because if I move them even a few feet, they, they get mad. They get mad because, not because I've messed with where their chair is, they get mad because all of a sudden the, the, int the connection they had, the ability to play together begins to fall apart and it gets much more difficult. So, so time is really, really important. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for that. Next question. Greg, the next question is, uh, oh, what's that? I next thought Greg is, was asking something. You wanted to say something, Greg, go ahead. Well, I, I, I just, I just wanted to say that's kind of, that's kind of an important point that this, the, this distance, because they, it, it's, it's now involved in so many things. But the the reality is that all mixing any of these kinds of orchestral pieces and stuff like that, you have to. In a lot of cases, you have to you have to time align. You know, some of these instruments and and people based on how far they actually were from each other. You know, so you, if you play them, if you play them at the at the same time in a um kind of role you know if you, if you what am i trying to say i'm trying to say that if you you know when you mic them not in not individually right is that, is that right you spread yeah even in a real and non-covid non-isolated non-distant situation right. those those fairly small distances 20 30 feet really make a difference both to how they play together and also how the sound gets to microphones and we have to deal with that that's all thanks right, so Greg. the next question is what are the things that your uh, parents taught you that are still that you are still embracing today I remember, uh, well, it's probably, I don't remember it, but I, I've heard the story of my dad trying to, uh, fix the garbage disposal. Um, so he was taking some things apart and, uh, as he was putting it back together, you know, the whole time I'm there, I think I was seven or something and I'm watching him. And I think this is, you know, kind of where I got started, um, being a tinkerer and, and liking to play with technology and things. And so, uh, you know, as he got to put it back together, I was like, he, he couldn't remember what came next. And I was like, well, that was the next one you took out. So that must be the next one to go in. And, and, um, you know, he kind of got me started in computers, took us, uh, my brother and I to a, a very, very early computer convention. Uh, he actually, uh, bought, I think it was the Apple II, and we had like serial number 635 or something. Um, so playing with computers at a very early age, you know, teletype going into the university mainframe. I remember uh, go, him dragging me along as he was doing punch cards, um, doing his statistics on punch cards, um, mainly because I wanted to get ice cream, because while he dropped the punch cards off, we would go get ice cream and then go back and pick up his printout. But you know, we played with that uh, a lot. It was always exposed to it. There was, um, you know, computer technology, early computer technology always around. And, uh, you know, I, I, I blew some of it up, you know, before, you know, I didn't know you were not supposed to hot plug the disc controller card. And, you know, looking back now, you know, <laughs> several hundred dollars um, that I just, you know, made go up in smoke as a kid. And, and, you know, just kind of went, okay, you know, just took it gracefully and was like, yeah, okay, that's what happens. So, so I think that, that encouragement to that, it's just stuff, you know, we should play with it. 
it's not going to, you know, even if it blows up, it's not going to blow up. You know, the, the world's not going to end because some disk controller card died. Um, you know, so, so the, it removes some of the, the fear and trepidation about playing with technology. And, and I try to instill that in my kids as they go to computers and, and to my students as well is like, you know, there's no self-destruct button. You know, try not to hot plug things, but even stuff today is, is pretty well designed. It usually doesn't die if you hot plug it, especially, you know, USB is okay with that, but you know, there's no self-destruct button. Don't be afraid to push buttons. Fantastic. Mickey, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah. Uh, you mentioned your father, Jeff, uh, and your, your dad that's also in education. I'm sure that sort of played a role in you jumping into education as well. Are there, what's the dynamic? I'm sure there are like stories of like the dynamics with you and your father, both being in education. Any, any fun it, stuff to share? Jeff, if you don't mind, just, you know, for, for those who are listening, just tell us a little bit about your father and, and answer uh, Mickey's question, please. So my dad is a, a lifelong educator, and um, he is kind of an, an expert in getting alternative universities accredited. Um, so he worked for Wal Walden University and Saybrook and Capella University. Um, and, but he also was and, and still is an, a tenor. He's a lyric tenor, and so I grew up with, you know, opera in my house, Neapolitan songs, you know, all these great things. Wow. Um, um, you know, and, and I remember at their small college graduations, he would always sing, he would sing, you know, three or four songs for graduation. Um, so there was, there was this love of music and this, uh, this, my mom was also a, a school teacher. So there was education throughout that. Um, I went, to do audio engineering and started out of college uh, working at uh, Sony Classical in New York City. So I was not in education. Um, but I found that as a technical engineer, I was hands-on, one-on-one -on -one teaching people. I was the person who had to figure stuff out. And once I figured it out, I wanted to teach you about it so I didn't have to come back. Um, and while I was still there, I started teaching adjunct for McGill University in Montreal, which was a, a fun experience to, um, for their graduate sound program, I would leave work on Thursday evening and jump on a plane and fly to Montreal. And they would give me the five students all day, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So it was awesome, intense, the six of us in the studio, sometimes on a whiteboard talking through tech. Um, but I taught all their digital audio uh, coursework. So it was like, here's how digital audio works. Now let's play with some digital audio stuff. And so we were, I would go up, uh, you know, two or three times a semester, um, very intense. And that kind of got the bug of teaching in me. So now I'm here at University of South Carolina. I've been here 22 years. And it's awesome because I get to teach and do audio engineering and now live streaming. So it's fun. Fantastic. Do, do you mind mentioning some of the artists that you've worked with? Not at all. Um, so when, uh, when I was in New York, I worked for uh, Sony Classical, which, uh, and Sony Music Studios were all part of that arm, but Sony Classical, um, Itzhak Perlman, Yo-Yo Ma, uh, Manuel Axe, Placido Domingo, the, Esapeka Salonen and the South Carolina, uh, the Los Angeles Philharmonic, uh, John Williams and the Boston Pops. So that was an amazing experience for a young Jeff to like get thrown into this where I could watch these amazing producers talk to musicians and just be able to, to listen. Um, and I saw you know, I, I look back now at the classes that were most useful in my music education and orchestration and jazz arranging just taught me how music is put together. I loved theory, um, but those, you know, really taught me how music is put together. And so to see that in the real world where we're working with an orchestra, we're working with a new piece of music, and to see these producers who, who could listen 
and determine what, what was great, what was wrong, and then most importantly, to know what to say. And more importantly, what not to say to the musicians when that take was done, to, to inspire them to communicate what they needed to fix and also to intuitively know what they already knew they needed to fix. And I don't need to mention that. Um, so that was, that was a fabulous experience seeing those, you know, amazing artists. Um, I had a great, great experience where we were at, uh, Sage Ozawa Hall in Tanglewood. And I was the, I was the assistant engineer. I was running at that time, uh, tape machines, digital tape machines. Um, and we were recording, uh, cello and piano, but at the same time, we were also going to do an overdub of Yo-Yo Ma on a cello, uh, recording. He, we'd already recorded the orchestra in California. He couldn't make it. So we needed to overdub him. So I got to sit a few feet from Yo-Yo Ma as he put the sheet of music on a music stand and began to learn this cello solo. First time he'd seen it. And, and, you know, the first time was like any of us learning a piece of music, you know, he's, he's there and he's kind of squinting at the music and he's figuring out the fingerings, but it was like on fast forward because the second time it kind of flowed a little tentatively. And the third time it was beautiful at a slow tempo. And the fourth time it just flew through and, and to see that, you know, yeah, this, this, this man is an amazing artist. And I will say he's one of the most, the nicest and most genuine human beings I've ever met. Um, I've, I've literally heard him. He always introduces himself. He introduced himself to my mother-in-law who came by a session one time and, and stood there with his arm around her because he doesn't want anyone in the room. He doesn't want to not know everyone in the room. So he goes and introduces people. But uh, I've heard him walk up to, to a conductor and say, hi, I'm yo Ma. I'll be playing cello for you today. It's like, yeah, yeah, we know who you are. So, <laughs> um, I really learned like to respect artists and it doesn't matter what level they are, um, and what kind of fame they have, but to, to respect that artistry and also to know that I can speak to their performance as a team who's trying to make something fabulous that, that. You know, I can use my ears and my musical ability to tell someone, to tell a cellist, I don't play cello, to tell a cellist how to change things or maybe to try something. And because we're all working for this goal of great music. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for that. Thank you. Next question. Next question is your virtual learning toolkit. Please share them at home and on campus. We talking actual tools, the actual hardware and things. Um, I love the little ATEM mini pro. Um, and that's used. I've got that here in front of me. Um, I've used that to, to stream chamber music concerts. So, you know, put four cameras into that, get good sound stream directly from the ethernet port. Um, so those things are fabulous. Um, and the camera I'm using is actually, you know, as, as education, I've been looking over the past 18 months for inexpensive tools. You know, I love the, the, the pile Polson microphones, uh, they found. Um, so we bought a few kits with those, uh, I have them in Ziploc bags with silica gel. And so we pass those out to, to faculty when they've got to do something, something important to get them better sound than what they'll do for, you know, just their laptop mic. Um, I'm actually just running from a, a $79 box camera. It's a little HDI, HDMI security box camera. Um, but it was, it was kind of hunting around to try to find uh, decent stuff. You know, would I love to have a, a black magic 6k? Sure. Um, but someday, <laughs> um, I don't know if that's answering the question though, about virtual learning tools. Um, yeah, I, actually I, w I was wondering about, uh, you, you did answer the question. I was wondering about, um, what you're, what you're using at home and you've answered that, 
but also what is the toolkit that you're using with the students in terms of instruction as well? So we're back in person, which is, which is good. Um, we use uh, Blackboard is our CMS. So that's where all of our classes are delivered. And so that will support all kinds of video and PDFs and other kinds of files. And there's discussion boards on there. So that will do all those kinds of things. The, one of the tools I love for building material is a software called Camtasia that allows you to do, it's a video editor, but it's also does a really good um, screen capture. So if I'm sort of working through a Pro Tools session, I wanna demonstrate something, I can do that live, but I have to do it every time. If I wanna record that, Camtasia allows me to record all the, the moves of the mouse and I can zoom in on sections of the screen. And so I can do a, a, a voiceover and I can add in other screens. So that's, that's a very handy thing. It's also a great way to make um, sort of narrated slides, narrated keynotes where you can do a little more highlighting of things. Um, when I'm in teaching uh, any kind of software, uh, I love a piece of software called Mouse Pose. And Mouse Pose just uh, gives you the ability to highlight the mouse wherever it is, and also shows all the keyboard commands on the screen. So it puts a little lower third with the keyboard command. And you know, I'm a big proponent of keyboard shortcuts, especially working in digital audio editors or video editors. And so as you're trying to teach those, you want to remind them and you want to, the hardest thing about teaching is remembering that where the student is. And it's very easy when you know it to skip by and you, you don't even realize what they don't know. And so you may be doing a shortcut because it's, you know, such instinct, second nature to you that your hands just go there. And so by putting it on the screen, it's a reminder both to them and to me, they can see what the shortcut is, but it's a reminder to me that they don't know the shortcut. So I need to work through that. Go ahead, Mickey. Go ahead. Yeah, I can totally relate with the, with the keyboard shortcuts because a lot of times um, people would ask me, oh, what's a shortcut for that? And I don't actually remember. I just have the muscle memory for it. Um, but uh, just going back to the question of like uh, tools, what's in your like, everyday like go kit or gig kit um what's what's in your crikey kit as well like that what do you always carry with you hardware wise hardware wise so teaching audio uh tech repair or just computer stuff so i have a macbook pro that's always with me uh airpods pro always with me because they're just convenient you know there's one right there um, tool wise, I love the, if I have nothing else, I have the utility key. Um, so the utility key is sort of the world's smallest Swiss army knife. So there's my keys. And if you look at that one, it separates apart. And on there is a serrated knife, a straight knife a bottle opener, a Phillips screwdriver, and two straight blade screwdrivers and a wire cutter. So that's, that's my crikeyest crikey kit. Um, <laughs> when you have nothing else, I have that with me. Um, does that answer your question? Probably not everything. Carl. So with the students, what, what hardware are they required or software are they required to bring into the course when they start the course? Uh, nothing of their own. So the intro course is truly an intro course and the intro course is actually a part of several uh, minors. So even someone who is a music industry studies would take the intro course just to get a broad overview. So I'm getting students who are uh, have nothing as far as experience. So they have the ability to use um, 
the studio equipment, and we have a few different facilities in the in the university. Um, and a lot of them will invest in sort of a monthly Pro Tools license for the, the editing of things. We're mainly a Mac house, but we try to stay away from running just Logic because many of the students are PC people. And so it's kind of hard to teach a Mac only software. That was going to be my next question. <laughs> uh, next question. How have you and your family navigated this space we find ourselves in? It's been a fun 18 months. So <laughs> like I said, we were, uh, we were on vacation. Um, we're down in Florida visiting uh, our in-laws, well, my in-laws, my wife's parents, and uh, my daughter and her boyfriend were with us on this trip. Went to Bush Gardens on the way back and then uh, came back and found you know, March, 2020 university closed, but we said they're, they're closed two weeks and then we're going to be back. So my daughter's boyfriend didn't fly home to Boston and he didn't fly home to Boston. And so the four of us were together <laughs> in the house and you know, what a blessing, um, what a blessing because man, we are, we are a tight, tight bunch. It, it, we, we loved it. I mean, you know, we hung out together, uh, wearing shorts all day. My wife loves to cook. We love to eat. So, you know, the dog got to take walks. Um, so as a family, it's, it's great. I mean, you know, I'm a homebody. I, I would love to just stay here. If I could work virtually all the time, let me. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you for sharing And that. And, you know, they always, they, they made fun of the panel because, you know, <laughs> I, I got up every morning, you know, I, I found office hours, you know, sort of sometime in April um, and kind of was a lurking for a while and then, and then jumped on. But it's like, you know, then I was on every day because I had questions and I had stuff I wanted to, you know, I wanted to contribute when I could. And also it was, it was, it was a connection. You know, we were all starving for connection. And so, you know, they, they would laugh because I would actually get up and, and, you know, go up there and I'd be on the computer for three hours. They're like, he's up there with the panel again. <laughs> now, now y'all are household names. Very cool. Very cool. Next question. Can you share how you think COVID will affect your work in the future? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I think we're moving to the point where COVID is going to be endemic rather than pandemic. That is just with us. And we're going to need to learn to live in that. Um, for me, I, really became a live streamer, a live streamer specialized, specializing in chamber music. Mostly, um, I picked up a, a few different chamber, uh, series, you know, in South Carolina that couldn't have audiences or could only have small audiences and they still want to keep streaming. Um, they've been able to broaden their audience because some of the artists that were there drew in people from other places. And now those people, you know, want to keep watching this year's season, even though it's not their favorite artist that was on there last year, it's different people, but they're like, wow, we enjoyed that. So, um, why do I say I specialize in that? Because I understand that music. I can speak to those artists and, you know, they're not sure how they're going to be portrayed when, when someone just says, we're going to start streaming. Um, so many of them I've had a relationship with, and so they kind of trust me, but also I can read music so I can follow along the music and know before the cello solo arrives that the cello solo is coming. And so, you know, cameras are ready and, and can switch to that. So things can be, uh, musically sensitive, at least that's my hope. So, you know, it's not the same as being in the audience, but in many ways it's better. Um, because you get a view that you couldn't get and you can see the pianist hands in a way that you couldn't, you can see things like that. Um, you know, 
you can be in your pajamas and have a nice glass of wine while you're enjoying this fabulous uh, performance. So that's been a great thing uh, for me. And I think that's, I think the, the streaming is going to continue. Um, you know, it definitely, it definitely made us as a university go, okay, we need to stream. And now it's just, okay, we're going to stream everything. So it's availability for our students. Uh, you know, when they'd give their recital, their parents might travel here, but can grandma and aunts and uncles and, and their friends from high school, can they come? No, but now they can send them a link, go to our YouTube page. You can watch my junior recital. Oh, I'm performing with the orchestra tonight. Tune in mom. So a great opportunity to, to connect, um, families, friends to watch these young musicians grow. Fantastic. And, and I just, um, because, because you and I, Jeff, have connected um, outside of office hours, I know that you are a, a very spiritual person. I was just wondering, could you share how you might be helping or have helped some houses of worship? Yeah, um, I've helped, I don't even know how many, several churches uh, get up and running with streaming, um, both with cameras and with, with sound. Um, my own church had actually decided to start streaming sort of in February of 2020. They'd purchased equipment. Um, March of 2020, that equipment, unfortunately, was stolen from the church. Um, so uh, I grabbed a camera that I could spare and, and an interface and we got them connected and, uh, you know, set them up with OBS so we could put, uh, you know, text on the slides and have a few different scenes and got things running before equipment, you know, because of course, March, 2020, it was impossible to get cameras, you know, PTZ camera was, was on back order for months. So, so that was great that I had that, that early on, uh, experience in getting the orchestra streaming that I was like, okay, yeah, I can do this. I can, you know, set up OBS and I've been playing with OBS for educational things to try to figure out ways that, you know, an inexpensive way that a, that a faculty member could, uh, run zoom without having an ATEM switcher and another camera, but they could set up their phone and run it into OBS and they could have a phone pointing at the piano keyboard and they could have their face and they could put a PDF of their music up. So I'd been playing with OBS quite a bit and that also went into the churches as well. And can you share what OBS is? Uh, open broadcaster software, I think is what it's called. So it's, uh, it's an open source software that allows you basically to take in uh, audio, video, um, documents, and do all kinds of manipulation to it. So for the church, we are taking in one camera, we're taking in sound, you can set your delay so that you match up uh, audio visual sync. And then you can set scenes and you can do chroma key or luma key. So you can put text over the top of the image or you can do lower thirds. So it's basically a video uh, switcher in a box or in software. Fantastic. Thank you. Talak, do we have any YouTube questions? You're muted. Can't, we can't hear you. Uh, <laughs> I can you hear me now? Yes. So yes. I just unmuted in the webinar. So all, all of our attendees heard that, but no one else did. So I apologize for that. Um, <laughs> uh, the question we have, an, we have a question from Jim Hankins. He says, okay. you mentioned the Apple II as one of your early technology influences. Is there anything you have come across recently that has similarly sparked your interest? Great question. I'm waiting for that 16 inch MacBook pro Apple, <laughs> the new, the new M one X, um, Dante has been an amazing, uh, technology for me. Um, just the, uh, 
the ability to, so Dante, for those who don't know, Dante is audio over IP. So it's uses standard ethernet stuff, cables and network switches, and allows you to send audio over that. Um, and for those who have ever dragged out uh, copper analog snakes, okay, so when I worked for Sony, um, we would record orchestras, and so we would set up a sea of microphones. So there might be 40 microphones on stage, and then there might be 300 feet of analog snake. So if you have 48 channels of analog snake, each one of those channels takes three wires. So this was hundreds and hundreds of pounds of copper covered in rubber. And you would drag this out and it would run down to the control room in the basement where you would connect it up to a uh, washing machine sized open reel digital recorder. Um, again, glad I don't have to haul that around. I can do all of that out of a backpack now. Literally, you know, a long ethernet cable and my laptop is more powerful than that. So just the, the amazing, uh, you know, it's Moore's law in every way. It's, it's the increase in technology. Um, probably for me, it's my Apple watch. Um, and, and I don't like do that much on it, but it's just there. Um, one of my favorite things I do is, is our whole university system uses a two factor authentication and it just pings me on my watch when I sign in and I hit approve because it's been on my wrist all day. And so it knows it's me. Um, so those kind of Fantastic. things have been great. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Next question. Um, our next question is, can, can we talk about your YouTube video zoom fatigue? <laughs> my one claim to fame on YouTube is my improve your zoom experience. Um, so that's now a pretty old video, but, uh, I did my best and a little bit of this was inspired by Alex Lin Lindsay, but we talked early on in office hours about how to improve, not just zoom, but all video conferencing. It works for teams. It works for Skype. Um, and we kind of very early on came up with a, with a laundry list of what you have to get right. And the very first thing was, was wired internet. You, that Wi-Fi just has too many problems. Um, we talked about this Wi-Fi stall, and I was like, well, if I can capture one of those, um, that would really show people. And I, I wasn't thinking globally. I was thinking about our faculty. I was thinking about the people that I have to be on a Teams call with. That's who I was thinking about, because I was annoyed at their terrible sound and video and their dropouts and things. So I was like, how can I show them this? So. I happened to, to grab one from office hours and got Alex's permission to use it where, where there was a, where there was a micro stall. And, and I, you know, I grew up loving, uh, good eats and Alton Brown and, and just his, his fun delivery. And so I tried to, tried to get a little bit of that. And this was, you know, you know, we were in COVID we're locked down, you know, we're, we're can't really go that many places. So it's like, I had time to like conceive of this. And so had the five, uh, internet, good audio. Uh, wow. What are they now? Uh, lighting. lighting. <laughs> Thanks Carl. Mm -hmm. Um, and then camera and then etiquette. Um, and so it was just about like, and I was trying to do it for as, as little money as possible. This was about just take what you have and try to make your zoom experience better, right? Rather than just assuming Wi-Fi is fine because you can watch a Netflix movie on it, plug into the internet, actually wire up the ethernet. Rather than assuming that you can just shout at your computer screen that your audio is fine because the other people hear you, well, you don't hear how bad you sound. So, so get a microphone. And I wasn't even thinking about, you know, actually having a microphone on a stand there. I just had them use the microphone in their earbuds and then, you know, get the, get the screen up. You know, if you're using a laptop, get it up on a stand. If it has to be books, um, I, I loved it. Uh, I saw a picture of, of our Dean the other day. 
he was out west, but he had a stack of paper plates with his laptop on top of it. You know, but he had to get the laptop up, right, up to eye level. So he's looking at the camera and nobody's looking up its nose. You know, that's a win for me, right? I don't care how you do it as long as you do it. It's just that little bit of care to make the experience better for everyone. So I'm, this is where Tony and I connected was the video. So if, if nothing else, I got to meet Tony. That was worth making that video. And, and Jeff, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to look into the camera when I'm saying this. If you haven't watched it, watch it. It's only four minutes long. And I actually used it last night with uh, the congregation that I'm working with. And it still was effective. So watch it if you get a chance. Four minutes long, really great. Um, yes, sir. We'll, we'll make sure that, you, that the link to that video gets in the description of this one. So when you watch this, you'll, you'll see that. Thank you, sir, for sharing that. Uh, next question. Um, the next question is, how does electrical signal, signal impedance match your concept of air impedance? Same idea. Uh, impedance is a tough concept. Um, there's actually a, a great podcast I link to my students. I think my students, it's an, it's an explain like I'm five um, and, and impedance. So uh, I don't know how technical you want me to get, but um, impedance is definitely something that's real important. Um, most of what we do in audio is a thing called bridging mode. So the output device has a low impedance. So a and impedance is the complex version of resistance. People kind of get an idea of resistance because maybe they've held resistors in their hands or they know that uh, copper wire conducts and something that doesn't conduct resists. So when I say it's the complex version, it's more than just direct current. It's also alternating current. And audio, because it has frequencies, is alternating. So the complex version we call impedance. Most devices, microphones, those kind of things have a low output impedance and the thing they're sending to has a high input impedance. So I asked the question, what else has a high input impedance? What else is really resistant to electricity? And air is something that is really resistant to electricity. You know, you have to get a lot of electricity for a lightning strike to go through the air. So. You know, we're all thankful for this because everyone out there has outlets in their room they're sitting in. And the electricity is not coming out of those outlets through the air. And boy, you're thankful about that. So if you think about, you take a microphone, you plug it into a mic preamp, the mic preamp has a really high resistance. So it's like plugging the mic into air. It doesn't change how the mic reacts. And more importantly, if the microphone is trying to pick up this very, very sensitive sound, right? Microphones work by your sound, the pressure waves in the air start the diaphragm, the little drum head in the microphone moving, and it gets turned into electricity. Well, we don't want anything downstream of that to resist that. So we make it that it doesn't try to send it any electricity. Basically, the microphone preamp is a, is a measurement device that looks back up the cable and just measures the voltage that's happening there. And that's all an impedance related thing. Um, and I know Andy is a guitar player. If there are any guitar players out there and you're wondering why this guitar plugged through this cable into that amp sounds amazing, but you plug it through that stomp box and even if it's in bypass, it doesn't sound as good. Or you use a 30 foot cable instead of a 10 foot cable, it doesn't sound as good. That's all impedance. It's all the way electronics interact. And so we see that impedance in the way that we're connecting the record through the needle, through the cone of paper into the air. We're making that transition easier. Same thing happens in electricity. Jeff, I wanna say thank you so much for making something that's complex, very, very simple and easy to understand. Thank you.
Thank you, Jeff. That was You're that welcome. was amazing. Next question. Our next question is, what have you found was the most surprising outcome from stumbling upon the office hours community? And that is from Jim Hankins as well. Uh, that would be the office hours remotes band. Greg is cheering. Um, or, or Andy's Andy's part of it. Yeah. The Loke part of it. Um, there's a bunch of us. Carl's a part of it. Uh, there's a lot of us. We'll welcome more. It's all about serving the music. Uh, it's all about having a good time uh, without a lot of pressure. But, uh, you know, it's just been, it's been great to make music. It's been great to work on music. And uh, we have a very special project coming that will be done sometime. Um, but I'm really excited about that. Um, we got lots of projects going that will be done sometime. But I, I really don't want to say more than that. But um, Greg did get We're to meet my daughter because uh, she got to, uh, we got to have a Zoom meeting because she's singing on one of them. That's fantastic. We're not going to get you in trouble um, tonight with Victor, so we're going to we're going to go ahead to the next question. Uh, we're actually uh, at the end of our questions. Oh wow! Okay, fantastic. Okay, so um, I I want to go back just for a quick moment. I was just curious, Jeff. What has your experience been with Audio Hijack and Loopback? I have not actually used them. I try to, uh, so my chain here is, is a, is actually an analog chain. So it's a microphone into a, uh, analog channel strip, um, which was pulled out of service at the university and I grabbed it. Um, you know, we just hadn't needed it. So I was like, okay, I'll use that. It's got a mic preamp. I'm doing a little bit of expansion and compression, a little bit of EQ in that. Um, but as far as I try not to do too much routing in software cause it can get really confusing. Um, I can see the benefit to it. Um, cause it, boy, it's, it can do just about everything. Um, but you know, I, I like to keep it simple when I'm, when I'm, uh, <laughs> when I'm patching <laughs> channels. If it's plugged into one on stage, I want it to come into one on the console. It's like, I don't want any kind of rerouting because, I mean, I think this was ingrained to me on working at Sony Classical because we would work these large orchestral sessions, which were union sessions. So, you know, if it was a three hour call for the orchestra, it was a three hour call for the orchestra and it started at 10 a.m. And they would have an hour of break in that, that's standard union time. Sometimes they were three hours, sometimes they were four hours, but a, a third of the time was break for them and they had to manage that time. If there was a technical problem, I was the person there on the, on the sessions often to fix it. I was the person who was responsible the day before for setting, we, we dragged all of our equipment with us. We basically used power and tables from the, from the venue. We took everything else with us. Speakers, microphones, recorders, communication systems, video cameras, everything. Um, and so if something went wrong, it was my job t to fix it. So I wanted it to be as simple as possible, as uh, straightforward as possible so that I could f troubleshoot and track those things down as fast as possible. Because boy, if I could do that in a few seconds and they didn't need to call a break, it didn't interrupt the flow of the session. And, and I kind of, I kind of felt like if they called a break because of a technical problem that I couldn't fix, that I had sort of failed the session because I'd, I'd really stopped the musical flow. And, and that's the thing is the, uh, audio engineering is a technical art, but the whole purpose of the technology is to get out of the way for the music or whatever the art form, you know, film, whatever it is, you're trying to tell a story, a musical story a video story, you know, film, whatever it is. So you got to get all the tech out of the way. And so I think that really trained me in troubleshooting and it trained me to be as, as simple as I possibly can because less can go wrong. Um, so someday I'll play with loopback and audio hijack. I've helped, I've helped Victor play around with his a little bit. So I'm a, I'm a newbie with it as well. 
and so um, I uh, I have this PR40 now, and um, I also have audio hijack and and loopback. So early episodes of Conversation with Tony Mobley, my sync was out, and so uh, this was a way in which to get me all synced up. So I'm happy to to I don't I don't know anything about it. I I just have the the patch so that I'm synced up. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy with that. And uh, make sure you so save I that just, patch, back it up. Yes. Well, I, I I've 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 taken a picture of it, and I don't turn my computer off unless I have to. <laughs> but in all seriousness, um, I um I've had an opportunity to have to. Uh, put it back, um, put the patch back in a, a few on instances. And so um, by no means do I know anything really about it, but I, I, I know enough to, to, to keep the stay in sync. So, when all Jeff, else fails, it, get a big piece of paper and draw out what you're trying to do. Hey, one step absolutely. at a time. Y- yes, sir. That's it. So I want to say thank you so much, Jeff, for for coming and sharing tonight in conversation with Tony Mobley. And I want to thank my panel for being here tonight. This was great. Fantastic. Jeff, you are a natural teacher. You, You take stuff that is sometimes very complex and you make it easy for people to understand. And everybody's shaking their head because it's the truth. And so thank you so much for, for doing that. And so um, I am now at the point where I want to do my my thanks. And so I am going to, I'm not actually able to see YouTube. So I am going to just sort of go through my list of, of thanks. So again, I want to give a special thanks to 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 Jeff for being here tonight, and I want to thank this this panel of audio uh, gurus for for sharing with me and Jeff tonight. Uh, I want to thank Kimberly Mobley so much for allowing me to play in this space and have conversations with Tony Mobley, the global community, family and friends, Alex Lindsay, and the Office Hours members, the DVE store, VD. VDO360.com for the use of webcams and the fact that they have supplied teachers during COVID, at the beginning of COVID, when webcams were not available. Talak Lopez Waterman, Mr. Ken Jordan, Shirak Shasido, Jonas Tatel, Marcus Lee Folk, Richard Lavery, and Chris Fenwick. And if I'm if I've left someone out, I ask that you please forgive me and make sure that I know for the next time. And so conversation with Tony Mobley will continue on next week. And we'll have as our featured featured guest next week, Siobhan Mobley, my niece. And she is the she is the co founder of Humanity Through Equity. And we'll have um, we'll have several guests uh, supporting her in the conversation. We're going to have our own Dr. Chris Clark, Ms. Glenda McMillan, Lawrence Nelson, Mark Horner, Michael Marv, and Ron Mobley, and there will be others. And so we ask that you go to our our webpage, conversationwithtonymobley.com. And also go to our YouTube and like and subscribe. And so now we're at the point where we're going to go to our fellowship hour. And so we're going to invite those um, those uh, people who are viewing us on YouTube and attendees uh, to come into the webinar. We're going to be in the webinar for maybe about uh, 30, 40 minutes. And we're going to turn YouTube off. And so if you want to come in, turn your camera on, turn your camera off, and just fellowship, we invite you to come into the the YouTube. And so without further ado, 
That is going to be our conversation with Tony Mobley, episode 10, with my friend Jeff Francis. Thank you so much, panel. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you, the production team who is producing this new and improved conversation with Tony Mobley. Um, it's just an amazing uh, adventure to be to be in this space and have this. And there's going to be uh, a tremendous, great conversation Friday morning on Office Hours with Alex Lindsay. And so, again, thank you all so much. And we're going to turn YouTube off at this time.